Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of statistics, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and an enormous selection of players and stat options are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million football fans who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code GET100. That's code GET100 at prizepicks.com slash get100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. It's been the least silly season that you could ever imagine. I think it's the whole trend for Formula 1 this year, where we could have had so much more fun, but we aren't. But I think, considering the driver market, the big moves might be locked out. And we're only just waiting to see if Red Bull end up doing something very dramatic with Sergio Perez. But guys and girls, there's still one more seat in Formula 1 that's very much under jeopardy. And today, we're going to hype it up, talk so much about it, and of course, get to discuss our favourite topic, Sergeant Logan as well. The main question for today is, are we really going to see Logan Sargent and Williams next year? I think the answer to that, probably considering the circumstances, would be yes. But every single person here on the Inside Line F1 podcast really disputes it. My name is Somal Arora. I'm the voice of the MotoGP Indian Grand Prix. I am joined by Kunal Shah, the former marketing head of the Force India F1 team, who's also an F1 consultant and an F1 expert for the Viaplay Network in Norway. And of course, to help out with all the numbers behind the story as well. We've got F1 stats guru Sundaram finally back in on the podcast as well. But would I be 100% clear in this, guys? I think we're all unanimously agreeing that anyone barring Logan Sargent, not, not my not my pet, no, Sundaram, not your pup as well, but anyone barring that and Logan Sargent should be in the Williams seat next year. Clearly, right? Yes, I suppose so. What, what, what is a long pause about? Honestly, you, you were thinking, you were considering. <laughs> like me and Kunal have a proper eight-page document for why he shouldn't. But you gave it a second. What's the what's the story behind I just wanted to cross-check if there were any positives behind Sajin's stint with Williams. But quite clearly, I think Williams need to look at a different driver for 2024. Yeah, why does it pain so much? Honestly, is the question I have for you. I think by any positive, one of the main things that we've always known, and it was adequately clear last year as well, was he, being American, is a big part in his signing. Doralton, Capital, also American, with the whole Liberty Media drive to have an American driver who's, you know, bred through the Liberty Media feeder series, you know, F3, F2, F1, etc. So he's probably been in the right place at the right time to get that drive. But the question that, you know, we are all trying to dig deep into along with data and not just make it all about opinions is, has he really done enough to merit an extension? And should he really get an extension for 2024, right? Guys, that's probably what where we're trying to go. One second. Uh, on that front as well, I think if we've all spent 20 minutes analyzing data and every single pointer says no... Isn't much of a debate, isn't there, Kunal? So why don't we tell the people what the numbers really say? Because, oh my God. But it's, it, I think at one point I just stopped looking because it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. So where do we begin now? I, I, I can actually vouch for that. When when we were preparing all the data before this, Sundaram and I were digging in through stuff and someone was like, guys, can we just start? Guys, I think we've got enough. Can we just start? And by him <laughs> saying we've got enough, we've got enough to prove our point that he shouldn't, based on performance data, be renewed, right? And I'm also going to put on a hat that... I used to put on when I was running the Force India Driver Academy, right? So what is it that you look for in a driver before you choose to go ahead or not with him or her, right? And the first thing, of course, is no crashes. But we've that's obvious that you don't want your driver to crash. 
The second thing, of course, is down to the fact that you want to see progression in your driver. By progression, you mean as the season goes, you are seeing your driver become better, faster, getting closer to your teammate, becoming more mature in 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 the whole in the cockpit and so on, right? And we typically look at just uh, we just typically would look at uh, qualifying or race data, but you also see free practice data to see how close the driver has gone and then you remove outliers like you know sometimes you're just testing parts sometimes uh the weather is different sometimes you just don't get in a representative time because the team are trying different uh, things especially when it comes to sprint weekends and so on so if you put all that in right this is going to be a three hour long podcast right but the truth of all of this if we were to you know sort of summarize it is he's had four crashes in the last four races after the summer break, right? So that's one part. Then the second what I've done is split into circuits that he's raced at before versus circuits he's not raced at before, right? Because familiarity always helps as well. Now, his average gap across the season to Alexander Albin has been five, uh, you know, sorry, it has been half a second. Even if you were to remove all the circuits he knows and he doesn't know, the gap still remains at half a second, right? So just throwing the numbers out there for you guys and for everybody else. Now, and to add on to that that as well, right? There's so much of teammate data that we can also consider. Now, I, I really want to talk about this uh, qualifying head-to-head bit as well, where every single time this year, Albon has out-qualified Logan Sargent. For context, last year when Albon was at Latifi as well, Sundaram, but if he was able to outqualify Albin a couple of times, and you know when it gets really worse, we so saw uh, Nick Tiffany is actually being sacked from Alpha Tauri midway through the season, and his qualifying record actually was strange. In 10 races, he was actually able to beat Sonoda thrice in quali, and he doesn't have a seat. Our man Logan Sargent does at the moment in time. And that's why it doesn't look good on Sargent. And, and like Kunal mentioned, the other two important numbers is the fact that Logan Sargent doesn't have a single point this year. All of the team's points have come via Alex Albon. And he's never out-qualified uh, Albon as well. So these two points don't look very good on his behalf. But probably one of the other reasons why James Wowles seems to want um, seems to want Logan Sargent next year is also the fact that Williams is really not battling with anyone yeah. in the Constructors' Championship. They are at a place in P7. Their target is P7 and they are way behind Alpine, which is, I think, 60, 65 points behind Alpine. If they were closer in a championship fight with any other team and Logan Sargent not scoring points, he would have probably been a little bit more critical, is is what I believe. It, it's not happening at the Aston Martin <laughs> camp. Quite clearly, we know that Lance Stroll is hampering Aston Martin's <laughs> chances this year of finishing P2, P3, and P3 or P4, and that's they're sliding down. But another fact is that Sargent not scoring points for the rest of the season is really not going to hamper Williams. They're going to probably end up taking P7. Albon might take a couple of more points through the rest of the season. But yes, he's not scored a single point and it doesn't really look good, especially when Liam yeah. Lawson has scored points. Oscar Piastri has scored points at plenty uh, off lately, but obviously he's in a better car. But compare yourself even to Liam Lawson, who's been here only for four races, doesn't look good on Sargent. Uh, on Sargent. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if Lawson is the 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 metric and, and, you know, where you make your comparison, it's very smart because I'm sure Logan Sargent doesn't want to be compared to Nicholas <laughs> Latifi, who clearly nobody wanted and was like, you know, uh, suddenly he's not even driving anywhere and else. He's, probably, he's gone off to study Alex, somewhere, yeah. right? If, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I actually beg to differ with what Sundaram said because, yes, Williams is not in a battle for P6 with Alpine, you know, four times the points ahead, literally 21 to 84. Uh, but Haas is just nine points behind. We've got sprint races coming up. And, you know, we've seen that all it takes is one crazy race. Suddenly, Haas with two really experienced drivers score it in and then boom what happens next you know so it could it could well be that they are in a battle for p7 so that they don't don't drop down but yes he's not out qualified um, uh, alban he's not scored a point this year uh, again uh, he's had just one q3 appearance he's had 12 q1 exits 
compared to Albon, who's had four Q3, Q3 appearances and six only six Q1 exits. Yes, Albon has more experience, etc. But like I said, it's the main fact, which is progression that really matters. And here's something fun. So uh, we are, of course, comparing uh, we are, of course, comparing Sargent in his first year with Albin in maybe what is his third year or whatever number of years he's done across the teams. But if you look at uh, uh, George Russell in his first year at Williams, he had 21 Q1 exits. <laughs> so at least on that stat, uh, Logan Sargent actually has a better stat out there. No, but... Uh- I think what you've mentioned only makes it worse because at this moment in time, when you look at that Williams and when you see what they've done at circuits like Zandvoort and Monza, you get a feeling that they have a car that at least on some occasions can do something as we've constantly seen with Alex Albon. The reason why I'll be so disappointed if they keep Logan Sargent is not because it's Logan Sargent. I think he as a driver can really do better in the course of time. But it's a case of a statement of intent. Now, a question for you, Kunal. If you ever want to break a bad habit, right, if you want to become a morning person, I know you've always been a morning person, but in case you do want to become a morning person and then someone calls you to go partying at 10 o'clock in the night, do you make a decision based on who you were yesterday or who you want to be tomorrow? I think most people who write a good self-help book will say what you want to be tomorrow when they say, right, dress up for the job you like or maybe act in the way you would want to see yourself in the future. Fake it till you make it, basically. I'll be really disappointed with Williams if they go back to another pay driver in Logan Sargent when their ambition, intent, actions are all focused in, direct, in the direction of becoming an upper midfield team. And it just it just doesn't add up. The behavior and the intent and what they try to show to the world really would seem odd, no, Sundaram? And that's why I think Logan Sargent really is a problem for them. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, actually that's a great analogy, Somil, because Williams is progressing. They've made great strides. They've hired a new technical officer, change in management, etc. And at least, you know, uh, from what we know, uh, Logan Sargent's father doesn't own the team. So at least there are no paternal mm. reasons to or familial reasons to keep him there, right? But uh, it's 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 a great point. If your car is progressing, if your team is progressing, but your driver is holding you back. Should you make that change? And there is a counterpoint to this because, you know, Sundaram said, I'm trying to think of the positives. And to me, the positives are that I would think that maybe after the summer break, he's been a little closer to Albin, if you were to look at it. In Sunfoot, uh, he made it to Q3 for the first time this season, but he crashed. Uh, in uh, in Monza, uh, he was 15th while Albin was uh, 6th. In yep. Singapore, his first time around, 18th versus 14th. And he's clearly not been as close as anyone would have wanted, but probably been closer. But he's also crashed, which means he's also trying really hard. So maybe James Wawel is just sitting down. And remember, James Wawel also comes from a racing background, right? So he's probably just sitting down and saying, you know what? Let's calm him down. We can't get rid of him till the end of the season. We want him to succeed as well, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So it's his way of trying to just mentor the driver. And this is also where I will quote the great Franz Tost. And I say the great Franz Tost because mm-hmm. while we herald Red Bull and Helmut Marco for uh, Vettel and and Verstappen Ma- and Ricardo and the and the great you know drivers that have come from that junior team, they've also been conditioned by Franz Tost. And Franz Tost has always maintained that for a driver to succeed in modern day Formula One, you need three seasons. And that's what happened or that's what is happening to Yuki Sonoda, right? But am I trying to say that Logan Sargent needs three seasons? Maybe he does. But your question of intent is where I'll also put in a question of spark. Hmm. When Oscar Piastri, there are three rookies this season. Oscar Piastri in just 14 races got a three-year contract extension. We all saw that spark visibly. Nobody needed to tell us, even when the McLaren was not doing well, right? Liam Lawson in just those four races, we've seen that spark. Alpha Tauri, comparable, really poor car, but against Yuki Sonoda, etc., He's shown that spark, which is why everybody's upset, saying, oh, my God, you know, Lawson's not going to seat for 24. But will somebody feel upset? Will you guys feel upset if Sargent doesn't have a seat in 24? No, honestly, uh, for the person, yes. But honestly, it's just that, right? Where Williams want to be today is something that they could far rather achieve with someone else pushing the car in that extent as well. Like Haas, I know they've not had the best year so far, but it's way, way better than where it was last year. 
having two experienced drivers helping out with development is quite something and then on the odd occasion uh, remember a couple of minutes ago kunal you mentioned that maybe one crazy race i think sundaram it was you but a one crazy race has both experienced drivers you never know what they can pull out that fact you can never say with williams because at this moment in time unfortunately it seems like a certainty that only one of them is going to perform and that's already like walking into a fight uh, walking into like a taekwondo fight but knowing that your ankle isn't working properly like what are you going to do about it punch it's not not going to work is it no this is definitely not the williams of the past couple of seasons surely they don't expect to be in the points in every single race but they have come a fair distance from where the team was in 2019 or 2020 where they were not scoring points through the season so like i said they probably don't expect to score points in every race but when there is that opportunity for the car to do well alex albon has been able to convert that and it seems sometimes logan sargent is somewhere close to albon but then he kind of just drops it similarly to what happened in sanford when both of them got into q3 you kind of i i i did exclaim saying that oh, okay even logan sargent is in q3 but then he goes and crashes after his first quali lap so it's important that when the opportunity does present itself to you that you take it with both hands and probably sargent has not done that oh yeah absolutely that is so well said and okay before we wrap up i'm going to just put it out there so okay w- one theory before i put it put things out there is sometimes drivers don't perform well but their team actually comes out to back them yes it's for psychological reasons but a lot of times and i'm not going to name drivers here it could also be for commercial reasons drivers may can have it in their contracts right uh that uh you cannot speak negatively about me for more than x number of times it's it's difficult to measure that but the commercial pressures can be so high especially for smaller teams who are relying on driver led sponsorships that you're just like okay not just not only is the driver bringing in points the driver is also bringing in money and of course in this case the driver is not bringing in points right uh but my my theory here was there are a couple of drivers on the grid who can still make it to that williams right nick de fries assigned with mahindra for formula e so he's out and he actually had a good debut in that williams mick schumacher toto wolf is aggressively trying to pitch mick schumacher for that williams and you know we've typically seen a wolf pitches for his drivers he ends up getting a seat as we've seen before whether it was ocon at reno or bottas at uh, sauber etc i hope Mick Schumacher gets a second shot in because he stayed one year out staying the second year out it gets only increasingly difficult for somebody to then sign him up i would say so i would definitely love to see a mick there knowing fully well that red bull will not release lawson to go there ooh that would be interesting right uh, because red bull are in the tricky spot but they want lawson as well but no i i really agree that mick would be the best candidate because Who else really comes to mind Sundaram nobody from F2 really has also grabbed both the hands and said yes this is going to be my seat no not that you need to sergeant was P5 in F2 anyway so no <laughs> not specifically i wouldn't say there's a specific contender for williams in specific maybe for other teams maybe for team maybe for teams like alfa romeo but specifically for williams if there is one person who i think should probably be driving for williams next year is maybe liam lawson maybe not even mick in my opinion but i would really love to see what lawson is able to do uh in that williams car next year he's done i i think he's done exceptionally well in the cup in the few opportunities that he's had this year i mean he doesn't even know if he's going to be racing at at the next grand prix looking at how ricardo is, is recovering but he's taking it race by race in that sense i think lawson lawson has been doing extremely well and i would absolutely love to see him in the williams car and i believe he would probably do better than sergeant but the i think the question is is james wowles looking only at the ability to score points or is he looking at something beyond that as well that's that's a that's a great point because you know typically over the years and this is for all the new fans of formula 1 each time a team scores points with both drivers or one they end up getting more money from formula 1 assuming depending on where they stand in the constructors championship and that's what we call the concord agreement right and typically a team has to decide whether you get a pay driver who struggles to score points 
but you are guaranteed some amount of driver-led sponsorship or you get a driver who has a higher probability of scoring points. So you get more money from Formula One at the end of the season. And of course, better performance also means that the team itself gets more attractive to external sponsorships, right? And this is always something the teams end up juggling. And uh, I would love to see a Lawson at Williams. Uh, could it be that it's Mercedes versus Red Bull yet again to place a second driver <laughs> at Williams? And I'll, I'll tell you the historic case here. When Albon was loaned by Red Bull to Williams a couple of years ago, the other driver Mercedes was pushing at that time was Nick de Vries because he was a Mercedes simulator driver. Now, this year, could it be Schumacher, who is a Mercedes simulator driver, versus Lawson? at for Williams next year and at the end of the day Red Bull settled this by just paying some money for Albon's seat that time so does Williams then become a team C or a C team sorry for a C team for for Red Bull the B team yeah. being Alpha Tauri and Williams having Albon and Lawson probably that makes it a C team wouldn't it <laughs> that's not who they really are right come on come on they can be better than that which is why it's so annoying to hear this entire chatter about do we really want Logan Sargent in there and I know commercial sponsorships are probably not probably actually generally very very helpful but where do you want to be in the future how far are they because in my head looking at the performances I think you're at that stage where they really can afford to take that risk of having two good drivers but folks that's about it from our end what are your thoughts? We really, really struggle to think of a positive, but can you think of one? Let us know by following us on social media and keeping in touch with our next events as well, because we're going to be back at Car Social this Sunday for the Qatar GP F1 pit stop. So check out the link in the description of this episode to join us over there as well. But until then, folks, this is it. We'll be back with the Qatar GP preview shortly. Stay tuned on the Inside Line F1 podcast, everyone, and see you this Sunday. Bye bye. <laughs>